Good morning, everybody. It's uh, September 6th, 2023. Welcome to back to Change the Shed. Happy you're all here. Um, here we are in September already. I uh, hope you had a good Labor Day if you're in the United States and um, you're having a good fall if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it's great to be back. I took some time off in August and uh, we're back for a nice fall of change. The shed looks like y'all are here from all over. Barbara's here from San Diego. Julia's here from Germany. She said, how are the puppies? I, uh, here's a picture. We got a couple dogs this summer and they are mini Dotsons and here they are, the Sal and Bo. I wrote some blog posts about them. If you're interested, I could go on about the cuteness of the dogs forever. But um, yeah, I always thought I was a big dog person, but now we have little dogs. So um, they're adorable. Uh, okay. And um yeah, Jessica's here. She is from Illinois and she asked, um, isn't the live with, I think she means Sarah tomorrow. Yes. I'll talk about that. Um, Janice is here from Portland and Leslie and Renee, Vermont, Massachusetts, Wisconsin. Glad your internet kicked back in, Mary. Betsy from Kansas City, Elaine from just down the road. It does feel like fall, right? Elaine lives in uh, a town that's not very far from where I am right now. And it's been cool this week. It feels like suddenly Labor Day hit and it's fall already. Um, Christine's here from Ottawa, Canada. Welcome. Nan's here from New York. Barbara from California. Brenda from Pennsylvania. Nikki's here from Phoenix. Yay, welcome, Nikki. First time here live. Um, yeah. And Nikki also asked about the thing with Sarah. So I will just tell you, Sarah Sweat. Um, Tapestry Weaver Extraordinaire will be um, doing a live chat with me tomorrow. It's not Saturday, it's tomorrow, Thursday at, um, oh, hold on, I have visuals for you. Uh, it's at uh, 11 a.m. Mountain Time, so just a half an hour after the time that's right now that we just started this, tomorrow, I'll be doing a thing with Sarah. And we're going to talk about weaving and uh, tapestry. We're going to talk about fringe lists. We did a four salvage warping class together quite a few years ago now. Actually, I think it's been almost five years. So we are, um, we've updated the class and we're going to talk about um, all the things about fringe lists, four salvage warping, also just tapestry and all the other things we do. So it's a great opportunity to learn more about Sarah and her current work and her past work. And you can ask questions if you want. Um, so yeah, I hope y'all can make it. It will definitely be recorded. Uh, so it will be just on my YouTube channel. I'm using the same tech that I'm using here today. So you'll just see it immediately after the live is done. It will be up on YouTube so you can watch it anytime. Um, yeah, so that is going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited. Um, to do another live event with Sarah. And we decided to use YouTube because it's accessible to everybody. It doesn't require a link or anything else. You just have to go to YouTube. So the tech is the easiest as it could possibly be. And that is what we were going for. So people can watch it. And if you have a YouTube account, you can ask questions. I'm pretty sure they don't let you ask questions live unless you have a YouTube account. YouTube is owned by Google. So if you already use Google for Gmail or something, you can just add a YouTube account if you want to ask questions. Um, yeah. Otherwise, if you have particular questions that you want me to address and you do not have a YouTube account or you can't come live, you could send them to me or um, you could put them in the chat right now and uh, I'll we'll talk about them. Uh, yeah, thank you for the shirt. Someone said cool shirt. Um, this is Harrisville Design shirt. I would turn around, but it says HD on the back. So Harrisville Designs actually sells them. It's really fun. Um, okay, so welcome. Uh, yes, glad Marlene is here from Texas. Yeah, there's all kinds of things going on. And so I just needed a little time away from Change the Shed to focus on some other things. I did go backpacking 
briefly. I have a blog post about that too, if you care. Um, some people are not at all interested in the backpacking, but I did some weaving on the backpacking trip, so that was fun. Um, oh, that's funny, Jessica. She said the automatic captions. You can get automatic cap. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to say that out loud because I don't know. But anyway, she said instead of fringeless, it said friendless, the automatic <laughs> captions. Fringeless are the things. Um, yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Rama from Indiana. Welcome, Sarah from Idaho. Uh, if I say anything wrong about what we're going to talk about tomorrow, Sarah will let me know. Um, okay. But yeah, the fringe list uh, for salvage chat tomorrow is going to be a lot of fun. So hope you all can come or watch the replay. Of course, you can do that also. So um, the next change to the shed will be September 20. And that is the end of my notes to talk about that and uh, when the next fringe list will be. Uh, I sorry when the <laughs> when our chat with Sarah will be, which is tomorrow. All right, everyone. I hope you've been weaving something and uh, had some fun this summer. A lot of people travel or are focused on other things in the summer. I find that. Um, we come back in September ready to do more weaving. So Sarah says, who knows what we'll talk about? You never know. Um, we both just got new dogs, so I can guarantee there might be a couple dog pictures. But um, yeah, uh, Lori, yes, absolutely. She asked if She's already enrolled in the fringe list class. Do I have access to the updates? Yes, the updates are minor. We didn't change the content really at all. Um, the platform that I'm using has updated how they do things. And so we did a big update in terms of the technology. So it looks a little bit different. Um, but, and there's a few links that I changed, but there's no new videos, although probably the recording from tomorrow will go in the class. And if there are particular questions that we haven't addressed, we'll always make a new video, but that's always available to everyone, Lori. So when I, when there's new content in a class, it goes into the source document. And so everybody gets access to it. And that's true in all of my classes. Um, Kate, good job. She says she just went um, solo camping. Nice work. I like to hear it. Um, it's good to get outside for a while. Um, Oh, Nan says Harrisville Designs has been out of these t-shirts for a while. They're popular, I guess. I taught there in May. I guess it was May and um, got a shirt then, but I'm hopefully they'll make some more. <laughs> nice comment. Roma said, um, Tommy Scanlon said, weaving is a jealous activity, and if you don't do it for a while, you will regress. It's true. Um I like that. It's an interesting way to put it. It's a jealous activity. I also think it's something that we should remember um, to support ourselves in the things that we love doing and make time to do them, even if it's just a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's look at some weaving. How about that? You may or may not be surprised to see what I'm working on today. I believe the last time I worked on this piece on Change the Shed, this piece, um, I believe I promised, swore up and down, cross my fingers, hope to die, whatever the kids say, that I would have this finished uh, by now. It is clearly not finished. So here we go. This is the American Dipper Tapestry, and uh, it is still a lot of fun, but it is still not done. So we're going to work on this one today, and uh, uh, next week I will bring, next week, two weeks from now, on September 20, I will bring um, a, a different, I probably shouldn't even say that. I don't know what I'm going to bring in two weeks. We'll just see what's what I'm working on. Um, I am just finishing all of the uh, samples for the next tapestry discovery box, which opens in October. So that is actually the thing I've been weaving is the um, new samples for the next tapestry discovery box. So that one is about um, 
weaving up in shapes versus weaving line by line. So that is going to be a really fun box. And if you want to jump in, uh, I'll see you in October. Uh, register for the new box starting October 1st. Um, if you register now, you can get the box from July, which was about weaving sideways, which was really fun. Okay, awesome. Well, let's look at some weaving. How about that? This is my little American Dipper tapestry. Here, I'll show you the sort of ratty, um, I don't know if you'll, I got camera weirdness today, but um, I don't know if you'll be able to really see this. I guess you can see it. This is my ratty uh, cartoon and uh, all the colors that I'm using at the bottom. So this is about a little bird called American Dipper. I talked about it a lot in the past, who um, lives in streams and does this little dipping dance and dives underwater. It's the only aquatic songbird. So it's a really fascinating bird. And this tapestry was an example for Summer of Tapestry prompt number four, which finished uh, in July. So those of you who feel bad about being behind, I'm right on board with you. Uh, let's work on this. So these are white little swirls um, in the water. The little pick and pick is about the little bird jumping up and down. And then the background colors I'm shifting around with different bundles because it's just really fun to change the colors of what's going on in the background. So it's been a really fun thing to weave. And uh, hopefully you also have enjoyed watching it because I've had it on Change the Shed quite a few times. Um. <laughs> yeah, Marlena, I hear you. She says she's feeling bad about the discovery box, not having time to do that, but um, it's okay. We always, we hope things will settle down and sometimes, you know, at least for myself, I just have to make time for things to be more settled. But yes, Marlena, you are in good company. Um, what I'm doing here is this little white line is this line here. So I'm filling in underneath it. Speaking of building up in shapes, we're going to fill this in and then put in the white swirl for the um, little water bits. This is, speaking of fringeless, I, uh, also speaking of tech, I really need an overhead light right here. So. There will be some studio changes coming up this year, and um, when those all happen, I am going to get a better lighting set up for Change the Shed, which will include hopefully a light over the top, so it doesn't change when my arm gets in the way of this light that's right on my shoulder here. Uh, I interrupted myself saying that this is a Fringeless for Salvage Warp, which is what Sarah and I are teaching in the Fringeless class. And so you can see that this is the bottom of the piece. When this comes off, this is a supplemental warp. And when this comes off, this will be the bottom of the piece and, and then the top of the piece is here. So it comes off without any fringe or um, knots or hems or anything else. It's kind of a really cool way to warp your loom. Let's see. It's my new go-to, well, it's not new anymore. I've been doing this for a while now, but um, it's my go-to thing for small tapestries for sure. I think it's really an elegant solution to hems or fringe or whatever. Okay, there's a little line there. Okay, sometimes the dots show up and I wonder what the, what the heck that dot was for. I could probably talk for a long time about how to manage cartoons also in terms of like drawing on the war for putting the cartoon behind. A lot of people would do this. They would put the cartoon like this and stitch it on. Let's see, there's where my and stitch it on right through the thing. If you're watching someone weaving and you see that there's big basting stitches through the weaving, that's why it's probably holding their cartoon on. I hate the sound of the paper. I have weird auditory things and uh, I don't like the sound of the tapestry fork hitting the paper. Literally, that's the reason that I don't sew my cartoon on. 
Plus, I like the accuracy of having the dots right on the warp, but uh, lots of people don't do it that way, which is fine. All right. I'm filling this in. It seems a little bit random, but I'm trying to keep it, you know, perpendicular to the warp as I fill in under this line here. Okay, that looks pretty good. These two colors are the same, so they're just meeting. All right. Angles. Angles are fun. One of my favorite sections of the Warp and Weft class is the angles section. I think it's labeled angles update. If you have the Warp and Weft class and you haven't looked at it in the last three years since COVID. Um, actually, I'm thinking, I'm not sure when I did the update, but it was before the book came out, which was 2020. So it's probably longer ago than I think. <laughs> anyway. How to do angles, that's my favorite section. One of my favorite sections of that class. And I'm just saying that because I was thinking about hills and valleys as I was putting this in and the hills and the valleys, or I teach that in the angles section of the class. Isn't it fun when I think that what I'm saying is you understand and something has happened in my brain that I didn't say out loud. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that tomorrow, Elaine. She asked, um, can you do fringeless on larger warps or do they need to the support of the edging finishes? Yeah, that is, write that down, Sarah. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. The short answer is yes, you can do larger pieces, but we'll have some examples tomorrow because Sarah's done some very large pieces on four salvage warps. Um, Oh, Rama. Yeah, great. That's another great thing. She's interested in how to do multi-layered pieces with fringeless. I think that's a fabulous idea. I'm sure Sarah will have great ideas about that. Um, hi, Hilly. Glad you're here from the Netherlands. Um, yeah, Sarah, I'm not sure if you're talking about as I, I'm weaving. Do you mean having this black instead of, is that easier to see or is that easier to see? I feel like the cartoons is easier to see that way, but the warps are easier to see that way. I'm not sure which is better. I usually would like gray, but. Um, welcome Carolyn from the north of England. Oh, great, Renee says she just finished the angles update. I remember seeing your sampler, it was great, Renee. A um, lot of fun and learned uh, a lot. Um, okay, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Didn't mean to make you into my secretary, Sarah, but that was a really good question about size of the size of things you can weave using um, the fringeless four salvage method, any four salvage method, but certainly this particular one that uses supplemental warps is one you can do larger pieces with. With a little fussing. I'm not going to say there's no fussing involved. All right. I'm going to actually use a shed stick as I do this uh, splice because it'll be less likely to mess it up. I still splice. Sarah. Speaking of, Sarah uses some other really cool things instead of splicing. She has a little PDF called Tucking the Tails, which is awesome. Um, partly because she drew it and it's just beautiful and partly because the tips are fantastic. So the way that she um, gets her tails managed, she talks about in that PDF, which is on her website which I probably don't have on my little overlay thing, but it's a field guide to needlework.com. Someone will pop that into the chat, I am sure. Okay. 
as I fumble my yarn colors. It's been really fun bundling. This is a ray, just a ray's yarn, and it's been I've been playing with um, values and um, bundling some of the different yarns. in a piece like this, when you're sort of depicting water, which is, water is so many colors, especially in a stream. Um, it's really fun to play with. Okay. To play with what you can mix and what happens. I could have the shedding device. This is a Merrick's loom. This is a Merrick's uh, big sister. And I don't have it set up with the shedding device, but I could. I um, find that on pieces like this that have a lot of tiny things going on that I end up just picking the shed anyway. So in this case, I didn't even put the shedding device on the loom. But I actually could add it. The clips are on here, so maybe it would get done faster if I added the shedding device. Probably not. All right. I'm almost ready to put in that little white bit. I don't like, see how I did that? I made the relays line up two in a row. I don't like that because I am not wanting a slit. So I'm going to take that out and fix it by bringing this one back and wrapping this one around. Oops. Um. Oh, Sarah, yeah, this is, um, I don't wanna change the focus on my camera, but this is something that, um, Someone else will know where this, um, the link of this is. There's a woman on Etsy who does bags and stuff for Merex looms. And she actually has this cool one. I forgot I had one of these, but I found it the other day and I'm gonna put it on my next loom. Um, a little pocket you can put tools in that hangs on the back. But this is just a double-sided piece of fabric with a couple ties on the top that's tied to the top of the loom. It's just a screen. And actually she designed it to fit between the two layers of the Merex warp. And so it's really, um, obviously you could make one of these very simply, but if you don't have a sewing machine or you just want, you know, this really nice sturdy fabric, I have a couple of them and I use them a lot. And so um, I think I put the black on here or the white side so that I could see the dots as I'm weaving better, but I do often have the black side in there. I like gray between the layers of my Merrick warp. And so I do often use a gray um, like a sort of, not super, super dark, but um, medium gray color between those layers. So yeah, if you use a Merrick's loom or any loom with two layers of warp, which the fringeless warp doesn't give you two layers, fortunately, you just have one. But if you have a loom that gives you two layers of warp as you're weaving, visually, it can be very confusing. If you're struggling with seeing what you're doing, try putting a piece of... Um, just a neutral colored paper or cardboard between the two layers, you'll be amazed how much easier things are all of a sudden. Um, I'm gonna put the, just put these to the back because I'm actually going to use them again after I put this little, so I'm doing this little white swirl and I'm going to use, I have been mixing this sometimes with this lime green, but I think for this one is like right in the middle of the design, I'm gonna use just white. This is the white that Array sells that is bleached. They also have one called natural, that is the natural color of the sheep, so it's sort of off-white, creamy color. But this, I'm sure this has been uh, bleached because it's pretty white white. It's maybe not as stark white as like the Faroo white that I was using on that wildflowers piece, but it's pretty white. Okay, so we're gonna put, let me think how I wanna do, this is a big enough form. I think I'm gonna put this in with two wefts. Mm. 
and it's an eccentric form. So I'm putting it in, oh, I'm gonna want that in the middle more. Putting it in um, not perpendicular to the weft, which is how you, or to the warp, which is what you usually wanna do. Oh yeah, Nikki um, is having some um, struggle with um, splicing, um, putting your things off. Yeah, um, we can talk about that in your class too, Nikki. But um, yeah, sometimes um, the tails of the splicing, it's easy to get them in the wrong shed and then it throws your shed off. So that's not, that's actually why I put this um, shed stick in there when I did that last splice because it made, I made sure that I didn't get the tails in the wrong um, wrong spot, but ask about it in your class too. And if you have a photo, stick that in and we'll figure out what you're doing. Definitely something that um, we should troubleshoot because that can be frustrating. Um, yes, Deb, great question. Do we talk about fringeless on a murex in the class? Yes. So Sierra does most of the teaching of the fringeless technique, which is so much fun. Um, and then I added, um, Sarah doesn't use Murex looms because she has amazing pipe looms and does not need them. Murexes are just fancy pipe looms. So yes, you can use um, a Murex loom. And I have a, a whole set of videos about how to use Murex looms for fringeless in the course. So it would be something like this is my big sister loom. And definitely there's many videos about um, the differences between mirror, there's not much of a difference. The biggest difference is that this bottom beam is thicker. And uh, this question is about the shedding device, but there are definitely um, visuals about that. Yeah, Mirax is just a fancy pipe loom. All right. Ah, good question, Kate. What differences do you notice between Array and Weaver's Bazaar? I was just actually wondering, I don't have a ball of Array right here. Oh, hold on. Maybe I do. Yay. Um, this is Array. I don't know. You're probably not going to really be able to see what I'm talking about here, but yeah, you can a little bit, I think. Um, if you have a big screen, at least you'll be able to see this. Um, the Array is the uh, indigo color and the Weaver's Bazaar is the red. The Weaver's Bazaar is, there. the Array is a little bit thicker than the Weaver's Bazaar. It's actually yards per pound. I can't remember what the yards per pound are right now, but it's um, definitely a thicker yarn. I tend to use three strands of Array at eight, three or four, and I use six strands of Weaver's Bazaar Fine is what this is. And then the other differences are just that Weaver's Bazaar Fine is a true worsted, I think it's, I don't know if the prep is true worsted prep, but it is spun quite tightly. And um, you can really, if you put them next to each other, you can really see it. The Array is fuzzier. And it's more like the yarn I'm used to using in terms of like the Harrisville yarns. Um, the Weaver's Bazaar is just uh, firmer and it has more shine to it. So you'll see a real difference in the um, fabric if you compare them. So weave a little sample with the Weaver's Bazaar and compare it to the Array. The Array is still has a beautiful sheen. It's lovely wool. Um, I love it. It's a great yarn. Um, but there's a, yeah, they, and they act differently too. Like the array is a little bit more flexible in terms of making your relays and filling up that little space in the relay where the two wefts meet and the Weaver's Bazaar is firmer. So you have to be a little more precise to um, make sure you don't see those holes. All right. How am I going to do, I want the top of this little thing to be just a little thicker and the rest of it. Mm 
Yeah, I really like both yarns. And actually, they play fairly well together. I haven't done a lot of weft bundling with Array and Weaver's Bazaar together, but... Um, you can bundle them for sure. Meaning I could have a few strands of Array and a few strands of Weaver's Bazaar in the same bundle. And I think that they would do quite well together. All right, so here's what Nikki's question about the splicing. Let me open this part of the shed with a shed stick. So the open shed there, and it might be hard for y'all to see this, but. just using the shed stick to hold the shed open can be helpful um, in this place. I mean, if you're using a Murex loom and you have the shed open as you do the splice, it's the same idea. Murex or the shacked Eris or any other loom with a rotating heddle bar. The Hagen loom has one. I've seen people make looms out of pipe with rotating shuttle bars. Okay, uh, we'll see how that does. Um, awesome. Cool. All right, now what's next? So what I want to keep track of here is there's some background on top of that, but then there's two more of these lines coming in. And these are kind of the most important central lines in the piece. So I want to make sure that I get this one in. And oh, I wonder if I have a marker. I'll show you what I do when this happens. Oh, of course I don't have one of the... Hang on, I'm going to look one more place. Oh, good. Here's one. I'm looking at my Sharpies and I want the one that says industrial. That's um, more permanent than this one says permanent, but um, they don't guarantee it. And this one is supposed to be actually permanent with hot water and heat. So what happens often is that the warps twist around. There is a line in here that has disappeared because the warps have twisted. Ooh, some of it, that's a little close to the white. I'm not gonna put all the dots back in, but, because I don't wanna draw on my white warp. But this is where that other, and then there's another one here. So often, um, and this happens when I'm using, um, this is a doubled warp on the fringeless uh, warping. It's two strands of cotton seine twine, but on regular warps also, the warps will twist and your dots will disappear. Can you guys see that? Is my head right in the way? Dang it, sorry. Head, move your head, Rebecca. There's only a way to shoot video through my body. No, that sounds weird. Um, a lot of the times when I'm shooting video, I'm actually weaving. If you can see what I'm doing, I'm actually sitting to the side and weaving sideways, which is a difficult way to see what you're doing. But I want the camera to have the view of what I'm looking at, but it's pretty hard to get that uh, to happen. I've had people say I should get a GoPro and strap it to my chest, but, um, oh yeah, there's another thing in here with a vertical line. Okay. Um, it would move constantly and that would be even worse than y'all would be so seasick. All right. Um, Okay, cool. Let's just fill, let's see, what time is it? Okay, we have time to just start filling this part in because, um, okay, so I need a color. I need this color, this mix. To go right in 
here and I bet I don't know where this tail went. Did I weave with it? I wove on with it. Okay. Let's look at our sheds. Oh, look at that. Awesome. So that is all the same shed. That is all the same shed. So if this one is going this way, this one needs to go this way, and I want it to meet. Okay. In the middle. Sorry for my muttering. <laughs> Gonna start this yarn right here, and we're filling up to do this next curve. The muttering was how I figure out what shed I need things to be in. And then I'm going to, that was eccentric. It was not perpendicular to the warp, but now I'm going to go back to weaving straight against the warps. Oh, I'll look at that. Rama says she could see better when I did the Christmas elf. Um, that was on a Mirax. Oh, you know what? I bet it is the color. I bet it's the gray versus the, um, yeah, and I don't have a gray, um, thing here and that's going to be too dark. Um, I bet it was that I had the regular Mirax and I had a gray thing behind it. So I will, um, try that on the next one. I'll get a gray. I should make one of these that has a the gray color that I like. Or I can get, make a little card thing. Okay, where is this going? So this, yeah, that's right. I'm gonna go back one more time here. Thinking like a tapestry weaver means also learning to think forward. Like, what am I going to need to do to fill that in? I know I'm going to need another piece of this green over here. And maybe it'll be this one, or maybe it'll be a new piece. But I need to fill in under this little curve. And <laughs> Janice says the muttering is helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Janice. I feel like uh, Emily um, does not appreciate the muttering most of the time because imagine living with someone who talks to themselves all the time. Maybe some of you do. But uh, it's really hard to know whether that person's talking to you or talking to themselves. I imagine it can get very frustrating. Because not only do I mutter while I'm weaving, I mutter while I'm doing everything else. Oh, I could do, I could change that. Let's see. Let's see if this helps. That is something, if I can get it to focus. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's see. That is that, I bet that's better, isn't it? Um, Turn back on the autofocus, so it's going to start um, going in and out. But actually, you know what? I'm going to use this butterfly, I think. No, I'm not. I'm going to bring this one out to the edge. Wrong shed. One of the disadvantages of being older and eye wise and weaving from the side is sometimes it's hard to see. Okay, I have a shedding problem clearly. Yes, I do. All right. All right. 
we will go this way because this is going to work. Just don't want to strand that. If I bring this down here, I can use it to fill in this other side. So that was an eccentric pass. There, so we've got that curve. What time is it? Okay, we might just have time to get this next curve in. I don't get distracted. Oh, thanks, Deb. I feel better. She says her husband has just learned to ignore her unless she says his name. It's a good trick. I'll employ that. Any muttering not addressed to other occupants of the house, I will preface with their name. That curve goes just right there. I might bring it over a little. Maybe I'll end it right there. Don't want the curves to be confusing in terms of running into each other. Okay, I think that might look good. Didn't quite get the shape there, but I think it's gonna be all right. I don't wanna take it out. And I don't think I have Oh, I am going to have another shedding issue, I betcha. We can leave to there. Yep, we are. This is called Crepeau, and this is the fast way to shift the shed when it's wrong. Under, under, under. Okay, these last ones for whatever reason are in a different shed putting in a little piece of one of the colors and now we should be able to put this whole white piece in to go oh dang it am I wrong oh no I'm right okay Whew. reason number one I don't weave it 32 ends per inch <laughs> I can't see it all right and then bring these back and we'll see what that curve will look like It's gonna look good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think I'm gonna like that. I don't know, we'll see. I'm not gonna promise that I'll be done with that by the next time you see me. Um, definitely won't promise anything. Because I'll only disappoint myself. Um, Yes, Rama asked, um, it's not a weird question at all. I love eccentric weaving, but what would happen if you tried to do this all perpendicular by changing yarn colors? You could definitely weave it line by line. Um, what would happen is that these curvy parts would not be as 
smooth. So the idea of the water means that I really want those um, curves to be smoother. And if they're woven perpendicular, you can weave them that way. If you wove them perpendicular and then use an, um, like an eccentric outline just for the edge of it, that would make them smoother. But if you don't, if it's a pattern and you don't need them to be smooth, um, a pattern that you don't need them to be smooth, you can absolutely weave it. Not that you have to weave it line by line, but that you weave it perpendicular so that you're building up. Um, this I think was what you mean, that you would build this up horizontally as you go. And absolutely you could do that. Um, it's a good thing to play with. The um, tap, hold on, where am I teaching this? <laughs> I'm working on something somewhere of weaving up in shape. Oh, it's the Tapestry Discovery Box for October. It's all about weaving up in shapes. And I have some comparisons of why would you choose to weave perpendicular or line by line versus up in shapes. And then I also talk about eccentric outlines and when weaving in shapes helps you do that and why would you want to do it kind of stuff. So gets at that question. This is a magpie beater. I think this is the one you were asking um, Jessica. Wow, that took like five seconds to come up with and I see Jessica all the time. Here's another magpie beater. I love this one. Um, these are ones that were made by um, the prior owner of Magpie Woodworks. I don't know, I don't think that Becky, who owns Magpie now, makes this particular one, though I have seen them on her website recently. So maybe she still has some, or maybe she is making them. She also has some newer beaters that are small as well. Um, and this was made by um, the person who owned Magpie before Becky, but hers are very similar to this. I don't have, oh, hold on. <laughs> this is the newest beater I got from Becky at Magpie Woodworks, which is so pretty. And her latest, she just sold these this summer. Um, she just made them. So they are, um, this is a smaller one. She has a, um, but you can see that the profile is a little different. Uh, hold on. There we go. Whoa. It's just a little bit thicker, just a fraction thicker. Um, I love this beater. I have now I have two of them. Cool. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, I've talked for a whole 45 minutes and shown you a tapestry you've seen many times and I will not promise that it will be done. But um, when it is done, I probably should show you because I don't know how many times I've worked on this recently on this piece. It's a lot of fun to weave on. So it keeps coming back up. So I'll be back on September 20, and don't forget tomorrow I'm doing that chat with Sarah Sweat at 11 a.m. Mountain, um, and there is a YouTube, you know, they do the upcoming thing, like I have for Change the Shed. There's one of those on my channel for that talk tomorrow, so it should tell you what time it is your time. Um, I'm in Denver, so if you put it in a converter, 11 a.m. Mountain time is the same time as Denver, Colorado. Uh, you should figure out what time that is for you. All right, everybody. It's great to see you again, to see you again. I'm glad you're here. And I will, um, yeah, come tomorrow and hear us talk about fringe lists and all the other weaving things. And um, otherwise, I'll catch you again soon. Have a super great week and keep weaving. <laughs>